Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Fatma Ismail, Director for Outreach and Programs at RC. I am so pleased to have you with us today for this wonderful lecture with Professor Bob Breyer. His talk is titled Tutankhamun and the Tomb that Changed the World. Professor uh, Breyer is affectionately known as Mr. Mummy. He is recognized as one of the world's foremost experts on mummies and Egyptology. As senior research fellow at Long Island University, LIU, host in Brockville, New York, he has conducted pioneering research in mummification practices and has investigated some of the world's most famous mummies. His latest book, Tutankhamun and the, tomb, and the Tomb That Changed the World, is now number one on arche archaeology new releases on Amazon. His lecture survey recent research on Tutankhamun and presents a picture of him not as a fragile pharaoh who walked on one side of his foot, but rather as a, possibly a teenage warrior. This light lecture also discusses the claim that Carter stole objects from the tomb. Using previously unpublished letters, the author suggests that more objects were taken than was previously believed. The lecture concludes with a discussion of the legacy of the tomb and how its discovery changed the politics of Egypt, the antiquities laws, and even how museums uh, function today. Please welcome Professor Bob Breyer. Thank you, Fatma. Um, you know, Fatma told me that there's more than a thousand of you out there, so uh, I'll try to leave plenty of time for questions. But let me explain what I'll, what I'll do today. Um, as you all know, it's the 100th anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And I was going to write a book for the 100th anniversary for Oxford University Press. And my idea was to do something a little different, but straightforward. Many people think that the tomb is discovered in 1922. The objects are conserved and moved to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. They're put in glass vitrines. They're looked at by millions of people. And that's the end of the story. But it isn't. There's a lot of research that's been done on Tutankhamun. And partly because of the new Grand Egyptian Museum that's being planned, they're moving all the Tutankhamun objects to the new museum. So they're out of the cases. And scholars have a chance to look at them, get their hands on the objects. And you know there are things in storage that people haven't seen in, in decades. So this was a great chance to talk about research. And I figured I'd have a straightforward book. I'd discuss the research that's being done on Tutankhamun. It didn't work that way. Um, most of the things I tried didn't go in the direction I thought they would. Um, but one thing that did, one thing that did was the story of the discovery. So let me say a little bit about the discovery. And then I'll try to show you the ways that I was surprised when I tried to study Tutankhamun. Uh, can I have the first slide, please, Fatma? Next slide is, there it is, there it is. Um, there, of course, is Howard Carter on the left and Lord Carnarvon on the right. And this is the story that stayed the same. It seems pretty accurate the way it's been told for a hundred years. Carter on the left is, is of course the impoverished archeologist. That may be a redundant term, but he is impoverished and he is an archeologist. Lord Carnarvon is the wealthy patron. Now Carnarvon was involved in one of the very earliest automobile accidents. He flipped his car, was badly injured, and went to Egypt to recover. And while he was recovering, he fell in love with the country and thought it would be a good idea to excavate. Now, those were the days when if you had some money, you could get an archeologist and excavate. And that's exactly what he did. Carter was at liberty. He was, he was a freelance archeologist, we could call him. And they teamed up to do some excavation. Now, for five years, they excavated in Thebes, not finding very much, not finding very much. But Carter had it in the back of his mind. Now, remember, he had been inspector for antiquities for Luxor. He had worked in the Valley of the Kings, and he knew the valley very well. And Carter knew that Tutankhamun was missing. Now, before the discovery of the tomb, Tutankhamun was just a name. Nobody knew anything about him. They weren't sure when he came in the 18th dynasty. They weren't sure who his parents were. They didn't know this, they didn't know that, but Carter knew he was missing. And he also knew he was probably in the Valley of the Kings. Carter had two, two, two clues. One was a blue faience cup had been found under a rock in the Valley of the Kings and it had Tutankhamun's name on it. The other clue was much more significant. Theodore Davis, a wealthy American, was excavating in the Valley. He had the concession. 
and Davis found what he thought was Tutankhamun's tomb. The little pit that he discovered contained floral pectorals. Uh, it contained wine jars, cups, bones from a meal, some mummy bandages, several things with Tutankhamun's name on it. And he thought he had found the plundered tomb of Tutankhamun. He was wrong. He had found the remains of the last meal eaten by Tutankhamun's family and friends when they buried him in the valley. Now, Carter knew that Theodore Davis hadn't found Tutankhamun's tomb, but Davis thought he had, and he gave up the concession. He even published his finds as the tomb of Tutankhamun. And he said, in that book, he said, I fear the valley is now played out. And he gave up his concession. Carter and Carnarvon jumped on it. So now they had permission to excavate in the Valley of the Kings, and they were looking specifically for Tutankhamun's tomb. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, a David Roberts painting done around 1838, and it gives you an idea of what the valley looked like in the early days. You can see some tombs are open. I think you see about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five tombs are open. Now, the one on the right is the one that's of interest to us. That's the tomb of Ramses VI. It's the one that's sort of just above the walking stick that the local is holding. Now, this is partly the reason why Tutankhamun's tomb disappeared for 3,000 years. Ramses VI comes after Tutankhamun. And when the workmen were excavating the tunnel into the mountain to make the tomb, they had loads of rubble, tons of it. And workmen don't want to carry things any further than you have to. So they took the rubble just outside the tomb and dumped it right on top of Tutankhamun's tomb, which is just beneath it. Now, if you show me the next slide, please, you'll see the tombs there. The long one is Ramses VI. That's the one the workmen were excavating. And then when they had the rubble, they just dumped it on Tutankhamun's tomb, which is at the bottom of that image. So Tutankhamun's tomb disappears from history. But as you guys know, on November 4th, 1922, the first step is discovered, and they go through the descending passageway, and they find Tutankhamun's tomb. There's a sealed wall. They put a little hole in it. The famous candle is held up. It, it flickers because the hot air escapes from the tomb. Carnarvon says, can you see anything? And Carter says, wonderful things. Right? Next, please. Let's look at the wonderful things. There they are. This is what they see. It's an interesting mess. It's a, it's a jam-packed room, which we call the antechamber. And I think you can see right in the middle is a couch. It's a funerary couch. It's a ritual couch. It's a couch on which various rituals were formed for Tutankhamun preparing him for burial. There were three of these couches. There's one to the right of it. I think you can see the tail of the animal there. And if you look at the left of that couch in the center, you'll see the head, the hippopotamus head of the next couch. So there are three of these ritual couches. Um, beneath it, those little white boxes, wooden boxes, they contain roast ducks for the most part. This is Tutankhamun's order to go. It's the food for the next world that he will be eating for eternity. Um, the reason we have so many things in the tomb is that the Egyptians were resurrectionists. They believed that the body would literally get up and go again in the next world. So you're gonna need everything. You're going to need food, you're going to need your clothes, you're going to need your sandals. So take it all with you. And that's what the pharaohs could do. So Tutankhamun is packing his tomb with things he'll need for the next world. Next slide, please. Now, as I said, I'm writing this book about the research on Tutankhamun. And, and as Fatma kindly said in her interview, um, in her introduction, I'm a mummy person. I, that's my specialty is mummies. And I was, of course, going to do something with the mummy of Tutankhamun. So, the first thing I wanted to do was look at this book, Scanning the Pharaohs, which is a, a 2016 book. And this is where we get the idea that Tutankhamun had a clubbed foot. The first place anyone says Tutankhamun had a clubbed foot is in this book. They did scans, cat scans, of all the pharaohs, all the royal pharaohs. And this is a terrific service because, you know, cat scans are much better than x-rays. So we had the scans and I start studying it, preparing, and I look at the scan, and I don't see a club foot. I'm looking at this thing, I just don't see a club foot. And then I started researching, and I saw that an orthopedic surgeon had written in, and he didn't see a club foot either. 
So I sort of wondered what's going on. And then I started thinking and thinking about this and then I realized something's not right. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things the authors of this book said is that because Tutankhamun had a club foot, he had loads of canes and walking sticks in the tomb. This is one of them. It's a kind of neat one. You can see at the top where the hand, hand would go, he's got a Nubian prisoner. And so whenever Tutankhamun would walk with his cane, he'd squeeze the Nubian in his hand. He's got the Nubian in his hand. Um, now, the idea that he needed all these canes, I think is wrong. It, it's misguided. As you all know, officials often show themselves with staffs of authority that are holding this long stick. Think of the guardian statues in front of the tomb of Tutankhamun. He's got a staff in his hand. No, he didn't need them. Um, but anyway, let's look at the next slide and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, look at this carefully. What we're looking at is the mummy of Tutankhamun in the gold coffin. You know, there were three nested coffins. The last one, was solid gold. Now, the reason it's solid gold is that gold was the metal of immortality. It never tarnished. The, the, the burial chamber was called the gold room. So you want to associate yourself with gold and Tutankhamun is buried in a gold coffin, 320 pounds it weighed. But look carefully at the photo. At the very top is the famous gold mask. It's still on the mummy. It was stuck to the mummy. Now you can see this, it's black in the background right behind Tutankhamun. He's been unwrapped of course by now. He's unwrapped by Derry. And you know, you don't think of unwrapping as lifting the mummy out and unwinding the bandage. It didn't work that way. When Tutankhamun was buried, about eight gallons of unguent, special oil, sacred oils were poured on the body. And over 3000 years, they've congealed. And when Carter and Carnarvon get to the body, it, well, Carnarvon never got there, he's dead by this time. But when Carter got to the body, the body was stuck inside the gold coffin. And they couldn't get it out. They tried different things, by the way. They brought the gold coffin out into the sun, hoping the heat would sort of soften it, but it didn't. Um, now, the anatomist who was called in to work on the mummy, Dr. Douglas Derry, was a good anatomist, really, really knew his anatomy. But he wasn't really familiar with mummies. He didn't really treat Tutankhamun very well. Um, he tried to get him out, couldn't do it, and eventually cut him to pieces, literally. Um, and then reassemble them. So this is just before they're gonna take them apart. Um, and now we can see Tutankhamun, but I want you to look at, this, at the feet where we have the club foot. Now this is where I started thinking, something doesn't seem right. I think you can see that Tutankhamun has sandals on his feet. They're solid gold, they're solid gold. Now Derry took those sandals off. He's an anatomist. Once he takes the sandals off, he has a clear unobstructed view of the ankles, of the feet. And he didn't see a club foot. Next slide, please. These are the sandals. They're fabulous, aren't they? Um, they imitate the way regular sandals were made. You can see the, the, the horizontal lines. They represent the reeds that were tied together to make the sandal and then along the border is sewn. So these are the gold sandals of Tutankhamun. But Derry didn't see a club foot. Um, another thing, and next slide, please. Let's see if we can do it. Yeah, we're back here. Now the mummy has been taken out of the gold coffin, examined, and then it's placed on a sand tray for burial in the tomb where, where it stayed for you know 70 years, 80 years. Now there's the mummy and his feet. But I want you to look not at the feet, but at the lower legs, the lower legs beneath the limb, beneath the knees. Now those, the, each, each leg is made up of two bones, the tibia and fibula. Now, if Tutankhamun had really walked on the side of his foot, those bones would be deformed because he was deformed from birth. A club foot comes from his congenital. Now, when those, those legs were, were x-rayed, they were normal, perfectly normal. They were x-rayed in the 1980s by, by R.G. Harrison. And those fem the, the, the tibia and fibula are perfectly normal. I don't think he had a club foot at all. Next, if you know, if anybody has a, has a, has a deformity or, or a problem with a foot, even a half an inch makes a difference, the pelvis will be affected. The acetabulum, the part where your, the head of your femur fits into the pelvis, that'll be worn away. Tuts are perfectly normal. 
So I'm really quite confident in saying Tut did not have a club foot. Now, that started me thinking, and this is where it didn't go as I expected. You know, if, if Tut didn't have a club foot, if he wasn't a fragile pharaoh, what was his life like? Well, one thing is, he takes the throne at the age of 10. So he's not going to go into battle at the age of 10, 11, 12. But by the time he's 18 or 19, he certainly could have been a warrior. Now, that started me thinking, is there evidence that Tutankhamun really was a warrior? Could that, could that be a real change? That would be a real change. Um, well, let's see the next slide. I'll try to show you my evidence. Now, I think you guys all know what this is. This is the Avenue of Sphinx, which connects Luxor Temple with Karnak Temple. It goes for about a mile and a half. And about 10 or 15 years ago, the Antiquity Service got the idea that it would be really neat to clear the Avenue of Sphinx all the way from Karnak to Luxor so they could recreate the procession that the priests walked. So now the tourists can walk from Luxor to Karnak and Karnak to Luxor. But to do that, they had to take down many houses that had been built on the Avenue of Sphinxes. And when they did that, they discovered that many of the houses, really quite a few, had used blocks from the temples as foundation stones. So there were ancient blocks beneath these houses that they were taking down. As a matter of fact, there were about 2,000 of them. Now, many of those blocks were eventually put back in place on the walls at Luxor Temple. This was done by the people at Chicago House. Now, I think some of you know that the Oriental Institute has had a house in Luxor called Chicago House for nearly 100 years. It's 98 years, I think, this year. And these people are what we call epigraphers. They copy inscriptions on walls. They don't excavate. They copy inscriptions. So they're both archaeologists and artists. They have both skills. So when they're copying a wall, they know they can read the hieroglyphs. They know how to fill in what's missing. And they do all of that. They do great work. They're famous for it. Well, one of these epigraphers, Ray Johnson, who is, was director of Chicago House for 25 years, just retired this year. Ray realized that these blocks, most of them came from Luxor Temple, and he was instrumental in putting them back on the wall. That's great. But there were about another 200 that he realized didn't go with the others. They were different. They were different in size, style, right? And then when he started looking at them carefully, he realized they came from a lost monument of Tutankhamun. They came from Tutankhamun's mortuary temple. Now, when a pharaoh died, he would build a temple where he would be worshiped for eternity. And the idea was the priests would come forever and leave offerings for the soul of Tutankhamun or Tutmos III or Ramses II or whatever. So Tutankhamun actually had a mortuary temple that was taken down, probably because of the heresy, the Amarna heresy. His father was a heretic and anybody connected with that would be you know, erased from history. So anyway, the mortuary temple disappears, but now Ray Johnson has 200 blocks from it. And he starts to try to reconstruct on paper what this mortuary temple looked like. And this is where I say there's some more evidence from this Avenue of Sphinxes that suggests that Tutankhamun went into battle. Next slide, please. Now, let your eyes get used to what you're seeing. You're looking at a block. We photographed the block here. And in the center, I think you can see the rectangle. And inside the rectangle is a man. We can tell by his garb, his beard, his hair, he's a Syrian. He is a captive. Tutankhamun is sailing back from warfare with the Syrians and hanging from the mast is a Syrian prisoner. That suggests he may have gone into battle. Now, it could be a boast. We can't be sure, but it's pretty specific. It's pretty impressive. Now, next slide, please. This is Ray Johnson's drawing, his reconstruction of one of the walls or part of a wall of the mortuary temple of Tutankhamun. The dark lines that you see, the very dark lines, are the actual blocks. So there's about five or six blocks here, and the rest is reconstructed by Ray Johnson. He's drawing in what's missing. But I think let's, let's focus on the block on the bottom. You can see the kneeling Egyptian army. 
You can tell they're Egyptian by their hairstyles, also by the round top shields, very distinctive. But look carefully, on their spears are human hands. This is the way that the ancient Egyptians kept track of how many of the enemy they killed. They would cut off the hand and count them, and that's how you accounted fatalities. So Tutankhamun is showing that he was in battle, and the way that they counted the hands was they put them on the spears of the soldiers. Now, this is the only time we have this, this scene shown. Later, we'll get scenes of pharaohs coming back from battles and counting of the hands, but it's not skewered on spears. It's something very different. Uh, let me show you. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a famous scene. You know, it's Men and Habu. It's, it's the scene of counting of the hands. And I think you can see right in the center of the picture are piles of hands. And you're going to have military scribes counting them. Above it, above, above the scene of the hands, a little bit to the left are numbers. I think you can see like two load in a column. They're in the columns. And I think you can see what looks like two lotus flowers. They look a little like Pac-Men. Those are the hieroglyphs for a thousand. So we've got 2,000. Beneath them is a curl. You see a little curl. Um, that curl is 100. And the tens are the, the, the things that look like croquet hoops. They're tens. So we got 2,100. And we got, I think, five, seven croquet hoops, 2,170. And then you have five strokes, 75. So it's 2,175 hands that they're counting. That's how many enemy were killed. So that's the way that they showed hands being counted in, in typical battle scenes. But Tut is ahead of his time. He's one of the earlier mortuary temples and he's showing them on spears. Now, all of this together, I think, you know, the idea that, you know, he's got a battle scene, he's coming back with Assyrian, he's got piles of hands, all of this suggests that at least he wanted himself to be shown as a warrior. And maybe he was, he didn't have a club foot. Now, one aspect of battle is the chariot. Next slide, please. Yeah. This is before Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. This is the only chariot we had in Egypt. Right? This is a drawing by Howard Carter. And it's a, it's a chariot that belonged to Tutankhamun's great grandparents, Yuya and Tuya. It's not a battle chariot. It's not. It's a chariot that would be used for like um, official processions, you know, that kind of thing, but not certainly not battle. But it, it's, 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 a, it's a precursor to what we're going to see in Tutankhamun's tomb, because Tutankhamun was buried with six chariots. Next, please. Here's Tutankhamun in his chariot. This is from the painted chest. There's a famous box that had clothes in it, big box with pa it painted on all sides. And it shows Tutankhamun in battle. There's Tutankhamun. He's in his chariot being pulled by two horses. And, you know, pharaohs always show themselves in this impossible pose. He's got the reins of the horses tied around his waist. He's all alone in the chariot. That never happened. You needed a charioteer to control the horses and steer them. But anyway, he's by himself. He's got his bow and arrow in his hand and he's shooting Nubians. And you can see the Nubians on the left. They're the ones with the arrows in them. So Tutankhamun is showing himself as a warrior on this chest, in his chariot. Now, let me show you something that, that puzzled me. I mean, really, really did. I think you can see that behind the horse's neck is a solar disc. I always wondered, what is it? What is that thing? Well, I think I can show you, but let me, let me show you Tutankhamun's chariot first, the real one that comes out of his tomb, one of the real ones. Uh, next slide, please. Nope, there we go. Nope, okay, that's okay, that's fine. We're gonna be fine with it. No, no, it's okay, you got it, that's fine, my mistake. Um, whoop, we gotta get rid of that. Thank you, Fatma, this is good. Um, this is a scene, a later scene, 100 years later, and we still got this pharaoh with the with reins tied around his waist, two horses, but you see the circle, circular disc, we got the solar disc again, right? That's gonna be standard for hundreds of years after Tutankhamun. What is it? I'll show you in a second. Next slide, please. Now I think I'm gonna get the chariot. There we go, thank you. Um, this is a color photograph by Harry Burton of Tutankhamun's chariot, at least the, the body of it, the top of it. Um, chariots were very complex war machines, 
very complex. They were made of three kinds of wood. You had to have light wood to keep the chariot fairly light so the horses can make quick turns and you can maneuver very well. And that's what we're looking at here, the light wood, which is covered with gold and gesso. And you can see two tech almonds cartouches there. But there also had to be strong wood for the axles so that they wouldn't break. And then you had to have another kind of wood that would bend so you could make the wheels. So it was a very complex machine. And they always broke, by the way. Um, in, in tomb scenes, you always see people re repairing chariots. Um, but anyway, this is Tutankhamun's chariot in one of the very early color photographs of Tutankhamun's objects by Harry Burton. Now, next slide, please. This was found in the tomb. And this is going to explain the solar disk. This object, I believe, I claim, my claim, is that it's the first hood ornament in the history of the world, as in a car hood ornament. What we have is the falcon, Horus. And on his head is a solar disk. And if you look carefully at the solar disk, you can see that it spells out one of Tutankhamun's names, Neb Keperu Re. There's a semicircle at the bottom. There's three strokes and then a scarab, a winged scarab. And at the top is the solar disk, the ray. So it's Neb Keperu Re is one of his names. And it's on top of the falcon with whom the pharaoh is always associated. But more important for our purposes, look at the bottom of the pedestal. You see the curve in it? It's kind of hollowed out at the bottom and it goes all the way through that pedestal. That was attached to the chariot. Next slide, please. This is a drawing of a Tutankhamun chariot, and you can see where the falcon goes. It's tied to the pole that connects the chariot with the horses, so that whenever Tutankhamun goes into battle, he is led by Horus, the falcon god. And th that solar disk on the falcon's head is what we see in the depictions of the pharaohs in battle right behind the horse's neck. It's that curious Egyptian perspective that gives us just the solar disk. We don't see the falcon, but we see it all the time. So that's the mystery solved of the disk behind the horse's necks. It's the solar disk of the hood ornament. Now, um, okay, Fatma, you, you got, got to get me a slide. It's okay, it's okay. Let's go to the next slide, just for fun of it. Come on, we can do the next slide. Um, now, this is, I'm not controlling my slides. That's why I'm, I'm just having a little trouble, not much. Um, this is another clue that Tutankhamun really went into battle. It's something that was hardly looked at. Um, part of the reason is it was very, very badly damaged, deteriorated. We're looking at a suit of armor. These are leather scales, which are tied, sewn onto linen, right? They're rawhide. They're sewn onto linen, and they would form a suit of armor that Tutankhamun could have worn into battle. Now, these scales, this suit of armor, was investigated by Andre Veldemir, an expert on ancient Egyptian leather. And he's the one who said it was worn. You can see from the scales that there's actually signs of wear. So the fact that it's worn suggests to me that Tutankhamun really, really went into battle. Now, one more thing about what Veldemir and his, his leather studies that I think is important. Um, he told me, I, he did a study of Tutankhamun's sandals. So Tutankhamun was buried with probably two dozen pair of shoes and sandals. And he studied them carefully. And I asked him, is there any sign of extreme wear on one side rather than the other? Because if he dragged his foot, if he, if he walked on the side of his foot, certainly the sandals and the shoes would show it. He said, no, they're perfectly symmetrical. So again, all of this put together, I think suggests that Tutankhamun isn't a fragile pharaoh. Actually, as a teenager, I think indeed he may have gone into battle. We have his chariots, we have his bows and arrows, we have him shown as a, a warrior, we have the blocks from his mortuary temple, and we have his armor. So I think Tutankhamun, it's a good bet that Tutankhamun went into battle at some time. So that is one thing that didn't turn out the way I thought it would. I, I intended to do the fragile pharaoh story. I believed it. I thought it was right. But when I started doing the research, nope, it didn't work out. So you've got to go where the research goes. So that is one thing that didn't quite turn out the way I thought it would. Uh, let me show you one more thing about, you know, that I, that I didn't work out either. Uh, next, please. This is a famous Winifred Bruton painting. Winifred Bruton was an artist who did portraits of the pharaohs 
um, based on reality though, based on actual objects that we found. And this shows young Tut. And she, she chose to show him where she, he's got all of his pectorals on his jewelry. Um, it, it's very, very attractive painting, but look at the dagger in his hand. That's what I want to talk about. You can see that he's in his, in his left hand, he's got the gold sheath, he's holding the gold sheath. And in his right, he's got the handle of the dagger and it's got a rock crystal pommel. You can see it sticking out of his hand. But most important for us today is the dagger is made of iron. The blade is made of iron. Now that's a big surprise. The Egyptians did not have iron. They had copper at first, very soft metal, very soft. Then they had bronze, which is a combination of copper and tin. Usually it's about 88% copper, maybe 12, 11% tin. And that makes it much harder. When you, when you put the two metals together, you get a very hard metal. By the way, it's a little bit like a magic trick. Copper is soft, tin is soft, but when you put them together, you get something hard. And the reason is quite simple. It's the molecular structure of the metals. The reason copper is soft is that the molecules align and they kind of slide. And that's what makes the metal soft. And it's the same with tin. They align and it's soft, they slide. But when you put them together, they intermix and they form a lattice and then it makes it hard. So they had copper, the Egyptians, they had bronze, but they didn't have iron. Now, where did the iron come from? Well, one clue is a phrase that the Egyptians had. I'll say it in ancient Egyptian, then I'll translate it. Bia M. Pet. Bia M. Pet, iron from the sky. The dagger blade is made from a meteorite that was hammered into the blade. Now, I think that's really neat. And, I, and in, in my book, the book I'm talking about, the um, Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World, I have a chapter that I titled, It Came From Outer Space. Now, I titled it that just to bug the ancient alien people on the History Channel, wherever it is, that they're always talking about spaceships and things like this. Um, I think they'll be disappointed, but this really did come from outer space. Um, now, where did the iron come from? Next slide, please. This is the dagger with another dagger that was found in the tomb. And they're quite similar, but only one had iron, only one. Now, I wondered, you know, where does this iron come from? And other people did also. And geologists started to look for an impact crater from a meteorite using Google Space. You know, you know, you can you can look from out of from from high up, and you can look for an impact crater and that kind of thing. So they were looking for that. And let me show you what they found. Next slide, please. There's the impact crater right in the middle of your screen, towards the bottom, right? And the map in the upper right hand shows you where the crater is. It's in a very remote part of Egypt. It's called the Camille Crater, and it's in the southwest corner of Egypt. It's so remote that nobody had ever been there. When they, when they zoomed in on Google Earth, when they were using Google Earth to come in closer, they couldn't see any tire tracks. No trucks had ever been there. They couldn't find the, any, any evidence of anybody having been there. So the geologists mounted an expedition to find this crater. It took them four days to get there. They're going over sand dunes. There are no roads. You have to go very slowly or else you turn over your Jeeps. Um, but they found it. And let me show you just for scale so you get an idea of what it's like. I'll show you the geologists inside the crater. Next, please. There they are, two guys inside the crater. And all around it, all around it, are little meteorites shattered from the impact. So is this where the iron came from for our dagger? Again, didn't go the way I thought it would. The answer is no. Meteorites have signatures. They, they, they're, they're not all alike. You can tell the difference between meteorites by the percentage of nickel in the meteorite and, and the way it forms. And sure enough, the meteorites from this crater don't match our dagger. So it didn't go quite the way it, I thought it would, but I have an idea about where the, where, the, where the iron came from. Next slide, please. In the Amarna tablets, you probably know that Tutankhamun's father was Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, who changed the religion from monotheism, from polytheism to monotheism, and was so unpopular, he had to move out of Thebes and 
found a city in the desert called Tel Alamarna, or actually Achet Aten, as they put it then, the horizon of the Aten. That's where Tut is born, at Achet Aten. Now, in 1881, locals digging in the ancient city found cuneiform tablets. These were the foreign letters written by dignitaries to the kings of Egypt. One of them says, it's from the king of Matani to Tutankhamun's grandfather, Amenhotep III. And it says he is sending the king, Amenhotep III, a dagger of gold with an iron blade. I think that's the dagger that Tutankhamun's holding. I think, I mean, just, just a, a theory that Tutankhamun took with him to his tomb, grandpa's heirloom, or an heirloom from his grandfather. So I think that's where the, the dagger comes from. But anyway, that's just a thing I can't be sure. So there, these are two examples of things that didn't turn out the way I thought it would. The, the, the fragile, you know, pharaoh theory, certainly wrong, could have been a warrior. And also the dagger coming from that meteor crater, nope, didn't do that. But anyway, we learn as we go. Now, what I'd like to say, I, I'm running out of a little bit of time. I don't want to leave time for questions. I can see loads of questions coming up. Um, I'd like to say something about the legacy of Tutankhamun. So if we can lose the slides, I don't need slides anymore. Um, let me say something about Tutankhamun's legacy and the tomb. There are three things that Tutankhamun has left us that I think are important. The first one is Tutankhamun changes, changes the way Egyptians view foreigners. You know, when Carter and Kinardin started excavating, Egypt was under the control of the British. They were basically treating it like a colony. And Carter and Carnarvon made some very, very bad decisions. They were treating the tomb as their own. First, when they were excavating, when they discover it, of course, it's a tremendous discovery. Tremendous. And journalists from all over the world come to Luxor to get the story. So they're bothering Carter and Carnarvon. They're bothering them a lot about, they want the stoop, they want photos, they want the story. And Carnarvon makes a fatal decision. He decides that he's going to get rid of this problem of journalists by selling the exclusive rights to the story of Tutankhamun and the excavation to a London newspaper, the Times, the London Times. Now this is a Brit excavating in Egypt selling the Egyptians' story to the London Times. All the journalists are furious. Imagine if you're an Egyptian journalist. You can't get the story of your own country's excavation. You have to read it in the London Times and then the next day write something based on that. They were furious. This leads to tremendous uprisings, tremendous. And the Egyptians get a sense that we want independence. And that comes from Tutankhamun. It's, it not, doesn't start there. It's from before. But Tutankhamun becomes a sort of icon for Egyptian activists who want independence. And eventually, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take till the 1950s. But they're going to throw off British rule and run their own country. So I think one of the legacies of the Tutankhamun discovery is that it leads to, it highlights colonialism in Egypt and eventually the Brits will be forced to leave. That's one legacy we have. Another thing that I think we get from Tutankhamun's tomb is the current laws of antiquities. When Carnarvon, Carnarvon and Carter are excavating, they signed a concession, a contract, which specified who keeps what and how it goes. Now, in the early days, in the days of Carter and Carnarvon, most excavations had what was called a partage. Now that's a French word. And the reason it's a French word that's used is the French are controlling the antiquity service. The Brits are controlling economics and things like that, and the French are controlling antiquities. But anyway, partage or division. When you excavate it for your museum or for your university, at the end of the season, all the objects found were divided into two piles by the excavator, and then a representative of the antiquity service would come and pick what, which one he wanted to keep for the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And then the other pile is taken home by the excavator to his museum or his university. 
So you excavated and you got a percentage of the fines, 50%. Now, when Carter and Carnarvon signed their agreement, it specified if an intact tomb is found in the Valley of the Kings, if an intact tomb is found in the Valley of the Kings, then everything stays in Egypt. The reason was that it would be so important, this first royal tomb found intact, that everything just had to stay in Egypt. So that's what happened. And this, of course, leads to Egyptians realizing when the, when the colonials are there, we want to keep our antiquities. These are ours. They're not Britain's. So eventually it's going to lead to a complete stoppage of partage. There's going to be no divisions of the fines. And by, eight, by 1984, we have a law saying nothing leaves Egypt. And that, again, I think, is partly due to Tutankhamun. One third, one third legacy we have from Tutankhamun, I believe, is the Blockbuster Museum exhibit. You know, in the 1970s, for the first time, we had a large number of objects coming out of Egypt to be displayed, coming from Tutankhamun's tomb, including the gold mask, the famous gold mask. Now, this was a tremendous success. As the objects toured, Right? It starts in the British Museum, then it tours other countries, and then it gets tremendous attendance. Now, at this point, Thomas Hoving, the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, realizes there's money to be made. Hoving realizes that if he can get the exhibit, he can make money by bringing people into the gift shop and offering spectacular souvenirs. Now, before this time, you know, gift shops and museums were places where you bought postcards, basically. But Hoving has the idea he is going to sell really high-end things, you know, designer scarves, gold replicas of Tutankhamun's rings. Um, even he had a $1,500 plastic replica, gilded plastic replica of Selket. So he's got all these fab fabulous replicas and things, and he really makes the mummies dance. That's the title of a book he, he wrote about it. And he invents the blockbuster exhibit. So now it's realized that you can make a fortune by getting a fabulous exhibit in a museum. And this changes the economics of museums. It changes it completely. Um, now people make, museums make money by bringing in great exhibitions. Before it was by admission, right? So Tutankhamun has several legacies. You know, we, we get the new laws of antiquities that everything stays in Egypt. We get Egyptian independence finally, and we get the blockbuster exhibit. So I think we are living today with an awful lot of legacy of Tutankhamun. Uh, but I think I should stop here because we've got about 15 minutes for questions and we can do it if you like. Is that okay, Fatma? Yes. 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 Okay. Wonderful. Thank you Great. so much for your wonderful presentation, uh, no, no. Professor Breyer. Happy uh, to be now here. we have time uh, for questions and unfortunately we have to end at three. So we'll try to uh, answer as many as possible. Okay. I'll talk fast. <laughs> uh, Catherine will read them out to you. Sure. Thanks. So there have been a couple questions about this. Um, is there support for the theory that Tut was killed by a hippopotamus? Ah, that is Ben Hara's theory. Um, the answer is no. Um, I mean, it was okay for a while. Let me explain. I, ben Hara is a friend of mine. He's a physician um, and, and he's, he's very smart, but I think he made a mistake here. Let me explain it. Ben is trying to explain why there's damage, really big damage to Tutankhamun's rib cage and his torso which is true. When he's x-rayed in the 1980s, it showed that, that he really had a lot of damage to, to his torso. The problem with the theory, and, and, and Ben says that, well, the damage is caused by a hippopotamus, maybe. It's not right. If you look at the 1922 photos of Tutankhamun, there is no damage to the torso. When the mummy's unwrapped, you can see clearly the torso is intact. That damage is done after the discovery of the tomb. Now, I know everybody's wondering, when is it done? I'll tell you Harry James theory. Harry James was the curator of the keeper of Egyptian antiquities in the British Museum. Harry James theory was that during World War II, when the Germans were there and, and, and the tomb wasn't completely protected, somebody broke into the tomb to steal some of the pectorals that were stuck in the resin on Tutankhamun. And, and some things are missing now from, from, from that mummy. Um, and they damaged the mummy then. So we don't have to explain the damage from ancient times. No, no, he didn't, wasn't killed by a hippopotamus. That damage wasn't there in 1922. We think it may have occurred during World War II in the 1940s, 42, 3, 4, or whatever. So that's, that's why I think the hippopotamus theory doesn't work. 
Great. Next question. The next question is, do you think the Valley of the Kings is played out? Ah, I'm, I'm not going to make the same dis mistake as uh, Theodore Davis. No, I don't. Um, now, you, you're going to ask me, what do I think is there? I'll tell you one that may be there, just may be there. I don't know. I really don't know. But I think there are discoveries still to be made. One of those people who's missing in, in, you know, in action is Anka Sanaman, the wife of Tutankhamun. We don't have her tomb and we don't know what happens to her. We know that after he dies, she is married to I, the vizier, and becomes his wife and, he, and, and I consequently becomes king by marrying Anka Sanaman. But her mummy is missing. So I think there's a possibility that we'll find her mummy someday there. Um, there may also be other even uh, Amarna burials there. People, you know, royal, the royals who were taken from Amarna when, when they moved out of Amarna and went back to Thebes, maybe even Nefertiti might be found somewhere. So I think there's still possibilities in the Valley of the Kings. Okay, the next question is, have you revisited the cadaver that you and Dr. Wade mummified in 1994? And if so, could you share some of your findings on how the mummy has aged? Oh, yes, we, we do. We do visit the mummy. I mean, some of the people may not know that, in, you know, not, as, as, as the questioner says, in 1994, um, Ron Wade and I mummified a human cadaver in the ancient Egyptian way to try to figure out how they did it. And we learned a lot. We learned a lot. Um, and the mummy is still, we, we like to say, it's dead and well. Um, we keep it at room temperature. We don't do anything special to preserve it. We want it to be pretty much under the same conditions as an Egyptian mummy. And every few years, maybe five years, six years, we take tissue samples, cultures to see if there's any bacteria or anything like that. And as of now, it's just fine. There's nothing deteriorating in the mummy. It seems to be pretty much as we made it 18 years ago. So it, it looks pretty good. Next question, please. Do you find that the theory that Tutankhamun may have died in battle or as a result of a chariot related injury to be plausible? Uh, I would say the fair thing to say is that we don't know how he died. Um, you know, I know there was a theory, you, you know, originally I, I wrote a book about 20 years ago called The Murder of Tutankhamun, in which I, I suggested that he may have died from a blow to the back of the head. Um, and that was based on Harrison's x ray where he thought he saw a possible blow to the back of the head. But the CAT scan showed that there is no blow to the back of the head. So he didn't die that way. And I was wrong. And it's okay. It's okay to be wrong. Um, now, the, another theory that I've heard is that he died because of a broken femur, the large bone in your upper leg, um, and maybe from a chariot accident. I don't think that's right. Uh, the femur is a very, very vigorous bone. It, it, it's really strong. And it's very hard to break it. Um, you know, the, the British keep careful records of trauma accidents. And the only way you see a broken femur in say emergency rooms or places like that is two ways. High, it has to be a high impact velocity injury. One is car crashes and the other is gunshot wounds. Those two things break a femur, but otherwise you don't see it. So I don't think Tut could have broken his femur by falling off a chariot. You're not gonna get high enough velocity. And uh, a colleague of mine, um, Mike Gillum and I, published a little article about this in the journal, British Journal of uh, Orthopedic Surgery. So I don't think uh, we know how he died. Next question. There have been a few questions asked about this. So what do you think of Nicholas's, Nicholas Reeves' theory that Nefertiti is buried in another chamber in a yet undiscovered part of King Tut's tomb? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Nick and I were just email, emailing this morning. Um, he's a close friend. Uh, I, I love him dearly. He's the world's foremost authority on Tutankhamun. I always ask, always ask him when I don't know the answer, um, and I think he's wrong. Um, I think I think it's a very, very long shot. Most of us in the field, I think, would love for him to be right. I mean, wouldn't it be fabulous if there's another royal tomb behind the North Wall? Um, but I don't think he's right, because I think there's been enough ground penetrating radar studies that said, nope, there's nothing behind the wall. I mean, three times there have been studies that said, no, there's nothing behind the wall. So I don't think it's right. Um, though I got to tell you, Nick has a new book out called um, The Complete Tutankhamun. It's a revision. It's, it's a redoing of his old book, The Complete Tutankhamun, but it's totally redone. And he has a chapter where he spells out all the details of why he believes that Nefertiti is behind the wall. And it's really worth reading, you know, because when Nick Reed says something, you should all listen. But I think he's wrong. I don't think we're going to find her behind the wall. The next question is, since the ancient Egyptians had known about iron before the boy king, why didn't they use it on a grander scale by the time of Tutankhamun? Yeah, um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is, 
Iron is very difficult to extract from the ore. It's a very, very difficult process. But the other is, I mean, I think the really closer answer, the more, more poignant answer is, is that they didn't have iron deposits. So they really didn't know how to do it. Um, the, but let me go one further about the Egyptians, because I think this is really interesting. The Egyptians were not quick to pick up on new ideas. You know, they were the greatest civilization in the world at the time, and they thought they knew it all. They knew how to do it. So, for example, they never used the wheel to full advantage. They never had wheeled carts. They never did that. They never used beasts of burden to pull <laughs> their sleds. They just didn't pick up on new ideas. Um, so, nope, there were several reasons why they didn't have iron. Next question. Um... <laughs> How do you think the authors of Scanning the Pharaohs come to the conclusion that King Tut had a um a club foot? Club foot, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> um when I read this book, you know, I, I just didn't see the club foot. And I I know the author, Sahar Salim who's a very, very, very good radiologist, very experienced in working with mummies. And I called her up and I said, Sahar, it doesn't look like he walked on the side of his foot. And she said, no, I don't think he did. Now, how did they come to the conclusion is what you're asking me, I understand. And I think I can answer it. Many, many people were involved in scanning the pharaohs. Now, Sahar Salim, did not scan Tut. She didn't do his body, she did others. But I think what they did was because it was almost like a book by committee, there were so many people involved that someone thought he saw a club foot and they, gave, they just allowed him to say that because there were so many people involved, everybody had to say something. So I think really it wasn't carefully vetted and that's how it got into the book. That's my belief. Next question, I see a lot of questions questions i can see the number <laughs> yes lots of questions um what is your theory as to why he died so young i don't have a theory uh, i really don't know um you know i believe that he was murdered and and that that comes not from the physical evidence of the body it comes more from the letter that anka Sanaman wrote um when when tut dies anka Sanaman writes the strangest letter ever written in egyptian history she writes to the hittite king the enemy and she says my husband has died. I have no sons. They say you have many. Send me a son of yours and I will marry him and make him king of Egypt. Never will I marry a servant of mine. I'm afraid. Now, what a letter. I mean, this is the queen of Egypt. What's she afraid of? And what does she mean? Never will I marry a servant of mine. I think she may have known that Tut was murdered and she was afraid. And she's looking for protection from the Hittites. So I think Tut may have been murdered, but it's not based on the physical evidence anymore. It's on the letter. Next. Do you, have <laughs> any, do you have any opinions on what Zahi might find in the West Kings Valley? No, I really don't know. Uh, I, mean, I hope he finds something, but no, I don't know. Um, has anyone speculated on the location of the meteor strike which produced the iron in the dagger? Well, that would be in Mitanni, that would be outside the borders of Egypt, I think. So we're not going to find, I mean, it's the kind of thing that geologists could look for now and search for other meteorites, but outside of Egypt. Okay, um, here's maybe a fun question. What is the most interesting question that you are researching right now? Hmm, hmm. right now. Um, I'm doing a little bit of work. I'm, I'm learning a lot about the, 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 the stolen objects from Tutankhamun's tomb. You know, one of the things in the book that I talk about is that um, more objects were stolen than, than people think were taken uh, out of the tomb and are, and are floating around. Uh, and, I, and I'm finding out all kinds of things about that. This is where I often go to Nick Reeves and I say, hey, Nick, what about this? What about that? Um, but it seems like there are a lot. Like one thing, I'll just give you one thing that sort of strikes me. The Louvre, the, 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 the French Museum, they have a Tutankhamun Ushapti statue. Now, you know, these little Ushapti statues were servant statues. They would come to life in the next world and serve you in the next world. And Tutankhamun had more than 500 of these. And they're beautiful little wooden sculptures, everyone a portrait of Tut. Um, and the Louvre has one. How did they get it? You know, I, I was at a conference just, I think three or four months ago in France. 
And the director of the Louvre, former director of the Louvre was there. And I asked him, I said, how did you get the Tutankhamun Shakti? I mean, it had to come from the tomb, right? And he said to me, it was very straightforward. He said, we bought it from the estate of Howard Carter's secretary. Now, what happened? I mean, maybe Carter had this thing. He took it from the tomb, gives it, gives it to a, you know, a colleague, a secretary or whatever. And then when, he, when Carter dies, it's sold. Um, but there are things out of the tomb. So I'm having a lot of fun and learning a lot by trying to track down objects taken from the tomb. So that's a fun thing I do. Next um, question. Next question. What is known about King Tut's mother? Ah, we're not 100% sure who his mother is. I believe it's a second wife of Akhenaten. You know, he's, he's not the child of Nefertiti. I don't think so. I think it's Kia, the second wife, who is not pure royal. Her parents aren't pure royal. But I think Kia is his mother. And in the royal tomb at Amarna, the tomb where Akhenaten was laid to rest, there is a scene of, I think, Tutankhamun being born. It shows a little baby being born, and it shows a woman on a funeral couch who has died probably in childbirth. And I think what we're seeing is the death of Kia and the birth of Tutankhamun. That's on Akhenaten's tomb wall. Uh, so I think it's Kia is the mother. Okay. Um... Did they collect the left or the right hands? Oh, what an interesting question. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. It's a wonderful question. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a funny thing about that, though. You know, there was a, there, on, on, a on one of the walls at Medina Habu, it shows that pile of hands, the ones I showed you. But beneath it is another scene. Now, somebody had said, maybe to the pharaoh, how do we know these aren't the hands of old women that you're cutting off? And then beneath it is a pile of penises to show that they were men that, that had been cut off. Um, but the right or left hands, very, very interesting. I don't know. Wonderful question. We have to look at the walls and see if we can tell. Um, could you explain more the theory that Carter took many objects from the tomb? Yes, I, I can. Um, I think first part, first the interesting thing is, the, is why did he do it? You know, how did they do it? I think the answer is they really felt privileged that this was their tomb. You know, as I said, this was colonial Egypt. This is Egypt under the thumb of the Brits. Um, and I think they felt they were entitled to it. I think another reason they felt entitled to it, and this is more about the reason they're doing it rather than how or why. Um, the reason they're doing it, I think, is according to their contract, as I said, they didn't get to keep any of the objects if the tomb was intact. Well, one thing that everybody agrees on the tomb was plundered slightly in ancient times. We know that because there's a handkerchief that was tied with five gold rings found on the floor and probably dropped by robbers as they're trying to get out of the tomb. Maybe they're interrupted in ro while robbing. Um, so it was not quite technically intact. For all practical purposes, it was intact. And maybe Carter and Carnarvon felt they were entitled to some of the fines, but they never got them. You know, the, the final decision was everything stays in Egypt. So, so they took objects and, and Carter was really treating it as if it was his own tomb. Um, he was actually giving them, giving objects away from the tomb like party favorites. One of the things I have in my book that I think is kind of interesting is he gave an amulet to, to Sir Alan Gardner, the translator, who was gonna translate all the things in the tomb for him. And, and Gardner showed it to, uh, Gardner didn't know it was from the tomb. And Gardner showed it to the curator of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, Rex Engelbach, and Engelbach immediately recognized it. He said, no, no, this is from the tomb. We have a bunch of these, just the same color, same thing, exactly. And Gardner got really angry with Carter. Um, he wrote him a letter saying, you put me in a very difficult situation by giving me this, this amulet and said it wasn't from the tomb. And Gardner never spoke to Carter again. But the, the, the exchange shows that Carter was treating these things very lightly, giving them away. Um, even we have Sir Alan Gardner's letter to Rex Engelbach, the curator, the curator at the Egyptian Museum, and he says, Engelbach, I want to make something clear. You know, I have this amulet, yes, but also Carter gave me the seals to the tomb of Tutankhamun. You know, on the wall, there were the seals of the necropolis, and Carter gave them to Gardner, and Gardner gave them to his kid as a souvenir, but Carter was giving away things that he didn't have the right to give away. So I think the one of the things I try to show in my book is that the, the, the taking of objects that didn't belong to Carter and Carnarvon 
was much more widespread than we thought. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll give you one last thing on that. I see time is running out. Um, you know, Howard Carter, when he died in 1939, left his house in Luxor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art because they had helped him so much in the excavation, loaning Harry Burton and helping in other ways. Burton was the photographer. Well, when Carter dies, he leaves the house and it's all its contents to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 1939. Now, Harry Burton, the photographer, packed up the house and shipped everything to the Met. This is after World War II. They couldn't ship it in 39, 40, 41, because the sea lanes weren't safe with the, with the Germans. And anyway, um, so it arrives at the Met in, in the late 40s. And when it's unpacked, it becomes clear that many of the objects were taken from Tutankhamun's tomb. There was a fabulous pectoral. There was gold nails from the, from the coffin, the gold, gold coffin. There were other items. And you know, give the Met credit when they, when they really realized that these were all from Tutankhamun's tomb, they gave them back to the Egyptian government and they're in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo now. So you know, there, was a, there was widespread taking of objects almost as if it was their privilege. Uh, unfortunate but true. And I think more objects will turn up in the future that we don't know about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Very convincing presentation, Professor Breyer. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I want to remind our members to please join us on November 21st. That's this coming Monday at noon Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. Cairo time for an exclusive members only virtual town hall webinar with Board of Governors President Dr. Dave Anderson and Executive Director Dr. Luis Bertini to learn about RC's new strategic plan, an exciting look into the future of RC. You can find more information about events, programs, and how to support RC by visiting our website, www.rerc.org, or you can also click on the link in the chat box and consider doing a donation or gift today. Thank you again, Professor Breyer, and thank, thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. Bye.